Hi, and welcome to the Mayor's Report. I'm Northampton Mayor David Narkowitz, and this is my uh, monthly television program on NCTV, where we talk about the issues and projects that we're working on here in the city of Northampton. On this episode, we're going to focus on a topic that you've probably been hearing a lot about, um, either in the media, uh, you've probably received information in your mailbox about it, uh, and there's been a number of public meetings on the topic, and that's the issue of flood control and stormwater. And we're joined today on the Mayor's Report by Terry Culhane, who is the chair of the Northampton Board of Public Works. Um, and he's been part of that public process, uh, going out and talking uh, to folks around the city about this, uh, about this proposed utility, and really, more importantly, talking about the background, the history, and the real need uh, in terms of this massive infrastructure uh, project. So welcome, Terry, to the Mayor's Report. Thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, and pleasure to be here. Yeah. So why don't you just start by just kind of giving us a, a you know, 30,000 square foot view of this issue uh, from the, from in terms of our city and our infrastructure and our history. Okay. So the city has uh, historically had flooding that goes back into the 1920s and 30s. And some of the uh, flooding was really substantial. I think on the screen we'll see a couple of pictures of flooding on Pleasant Street and on Lower Main Street. In response to these flooding, which also impacted communities up and down the river, the federal government came in just before World War II, mm -hmm. and they offered the communities basically a deal. The government said, we will build flood protection works, levees, for each of these municipalities, but in return, the municipality agreed, and Mayor William Fiker, back in 1938, signed this agreement, mm -hmm. The municipalities agreed to maintain the flood control works in perpetuity. So the deal was the government builds it, we maintain it. Mm -hmm. and, and frankly, for years, the Army Corps of Engineers was fairly relaxed about any maintenance requirements. I, I think uh, in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina mm -hmm. uh, and Hurricane Sandy, they're progressively stepping up their efforts to get communities to maintain and take care of these And you mentioned facilities. you mentioned Katrina, you know, our flood control system, our levees are of the same vintage as the ones in New Orleans. They are. There are about 25 communities in Massachusetts where the Army Corps of Engineers came in and built flood control works. Ours is the second oldest and it's one of the largest ones in the state. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the important thing to understand is, first of all, the scale of the system. And if I could talk about that for a moment. Definitely, definitely. If you look at a map of the city, you can see the flood control levees that wrap around the lower part of the city. They start up around Pomeroy Terrace, wrap around past the bowling alley on Pleasant Street, mm -hmm. and die up into um, Lyme, the, the highland around Lyman Road and South Street. Mm -hmm. This levee system has a pump station at the, at the lowest point. And we know that the levees are both going to protect us from the river on the Connecticut Riverside, but they also create a bowl with a lip on the city side. Mm -hmm. So if it's raining hard in the city, we have to use a massive pump system to move the water from the city side of the levee over to the Connecticut River side of the levee. This pump station is a huge piece of equipment, uh, three monster pumps. I, I tell people in some of the presentations, if we turn these pumps on, we could fill a backyard in-ground swimming pool in eight or nine seconds. Mm -hmm. These are massive pumps, and that's required if there's a hurricane sitting on the city, they're required to move the water out toward the Connecticut River side of the levee system. And that pump station is of the same vintage as the, uh, yes. as the levee system. Yeah. The engines in the pump station were the same engines they used for PT boats during World War II. Mm -hmm. uh, as a matter of fact, one of the engines is down right now. In routine testing, one of the pieces failed. Mm -hmm. It took us almost a month to find a, a machine shop who could fabricate. There are no parts available. Mm -hmm. You have to fabricate the parts. Mm -hmm. It took us almost a month before we could find a machine shop that was willing to take the project on. And they need another month to fabricate the part. Mm -hmm. If we had a failure during a, an emergency, that, that's just yeah. unworkable. So the Army Corps of Engineers, the folks who built this, who built this levee mm -hmm. system, turned it over. They're now us. they're now coming forward uh, and placing some, uh, giving some deadlines they and, are. and placing some uh, some benchmarks on the city in terms of the work that we need to do. Right. 
And they're, I should stress, they're not asking us to improve the system. They're not asking us to make it larger. Mm -hmm. They're not asking us to make it fancier. They're mm -hmm. asking us to maintain it mm -hmm. and keep it in working order. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so they have given us some very specific um, requirements and timelines. Mm -hmm. They want us to improve the maintenance, dredge the uh, Mill River. They want us to institute some engineering studies that will look into were the assumptions back in the 1930s adequate? Mm -hmm. would, would we look at the same problems right now and come up with similar conclusions as to what they came up with back mm -hmm. in the 30s? Mm -hmm. uh, is the structure still stable? Mm -hmm. If there was a little earthquake, would it collapse? Mm -hmm. uh, that sort of thing. I know there's even issues as simple as removing tree growth that has yes. occurred in and around the levees Absolutely. because that could compromise the, the levee walls. Yeah. And I know, I know they've come and shown videos of, uh, of simulated collapses of levees Absolutely. because one little pinhole occurs yeah. uh, and then the levee gives way. So It's interesting. The levees are not water, um, they're not impermeable. Mm -hmm. So if the Connecticut River is high at flood stage, the levees are designed to let the water from the river slowly seep through. Mm -hmm. And if there are tree roots running through it, then suddenly the water starts coming through much more quickly by following the roots. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it compromises the integrity of the whole design. Yeah. The other piece of the flood control is over by the Smith College Pond. Mm -hmm. uh, the Smith College Pond used to run basically past the roundhouse behind City Hall mm -hmm. and more or less down Conn Street mm -hmm. uh, in the late 30s. The Army Corps of Engineers redirected that river. Mm -hmm. Now it goes over the dam, mm -hmm. and it comes out down by the old K Lane Motors. Yeah, that's not the course that the river wants to take. Exactly. So they put in a, a, a levee and a, a long channel to force the river to go in that direction. Mm -hmm. I actually I live on South Park Terrace, okay, uh, which is right near that uh, Mill River Bridge. And legend has it that the Army Corps of Engineers actually rented a house on our street. Uh, when they right. were doing that massive construction project, and that was, was one their of their office. bases of operation. Yeah. So uh, I assume it was a massive undertaking. Well, the bottom line of all of the Army's new requirements is they want us to spend, we estimate, about $1,200,000 on initial maintenance and these engineering studies. Mm -hmm. We fully anticipate, based on the specific studies they want us to do, that there are going to be more expenses on the back end. Mm -hmm. We just need the study to detail exactly what we need to spend the money on. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we know that in addition to the one million two hundred thousand, there's going to be another two or three million dollars behind that. Mm -hmm. The other big piece of our infrastructure is stormwater, mm -hmm. um, specifically stormwater that falls on the streets. Once you put a curb on the street, every time you have a little bit of a low spot, you get a small lake. Mm -hmm. In the winter, you get an ice skating rink. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you begin putting curbs on streets, you need to put in some kind of drainage system for driver safety. Mm -hmm. um, we have an amazingly um, extensive stormwater drainage system all over the city. We have almost 5,000 catch basins, the little grates next to the curb along the sides of the streets. Mm -hmm. We have almost 5,000 of those. They're interconnected with 114 miles of pipe and in almost 400 spots around the city, the water we collect on the street gets drained out into a little river or a stream or a wetland or a swamp. Mm -hmm. So we're taking water that's in a place where we don't want it to be on the street and we're dumping it into a place that's out of our way. Mm -hmm. In a storm, uh, as a matter of fact, almost exactly 30 days ago, uh, November 27th, mm -hmm. we had 2.51 inches of rain here in Northampton. Mm -hmm. I remember. Um, that was not an extraordinary, it was a rainy day for sure, mm -hmm. but that was mm -hmm. not extraordinary. That mm -hmm. was hardly an emergency of mm -hmm. any sort. Mm -hmm. But it left almost 1.5 billion gallons of water on Northampton. Mm -hmm. uh, now, not all of that went down the storm drains, but a lot of it did. Mm -hmm. So the, the storm drainage system on that day handled something on the order of, say, half a billion gallons of water. Mm -hmm. So we're dumping this water into rivers, mm -hmm. which falls under the coverage of the EPA and the Clean Water Act. Mm -hmm. We're not allowed to just do this. We yeah. have to have a permit that exactly. allows us to do this. Exactly. Well, the EPA is, uh, has announced that we're going to get a new permit, and they're raising the requirements. So this is the other thing that's changing mm -hmm. as far as how we normally 
how much money we normally spend on stormwater and okay. flood control. The EPA permit wants us to begin cleaning the streets more frequently. The concern is that the, the road salt, the sand, the trash that accumulates on mm -hmm. the streets, mm -hmm. they don't want that to run down the nearest drain and off into a little river mm -hmm. the first time there's a rainstorm. Exactly. Uh, so they want us also to clean out the actual catch basins. At mm -hmm. the bottom of that little catch basin, it's like a big tube going into the ground. Mm -hmm. At the bottom, silt accumulates, muck, mm -hmm. contaminations, mm -hmm. motor oil coming mm -hmm. out the street, gasoline. They want us to clean the muck out on a more regular basis. Mm -hmm. We try, yeah, yeah. You know, as it is now. But they want us to specif specifically get to every single catch basin once a year. Folks may have seen those tr DPW trucks that basically have like a large arm that goes yeah, down and the claw kind of goes claw down. and grabs the muck and brings yeah. it out. Uh, so they want that to happen every one of those twice least, a year. Well, at least once a year. Mm -hmm. And then we have to actually have a report every time we open a manhole, we have to identify how deep the muck is. Mm -hmm. And there are standards about that. Mm -hmm. if, we, if a particular manhole doesn't meet those standards, they want us to go back more frequently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the net of this and it's remarkable to think about it, but we have to open up one of the catch basins and clean it approximately once every 14 minutes, mm -hmm. week in, week out, for seven or eight months out of the year. Mm -hmm. We can't do it in the middle of the winter. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can put a dollar amount on that. Mm -hmm. You say, okay, how long does it take to clean one catch basin? Mm -hmm. And you need a, there's a truck, there are two guys, mm -hmm. there's gas, mm -hmm. and so you can estimate what it's going to cost to meet these new requirements. Mm -hmm. The sum total of all of the EPA requirements is going to be on the order of an additional three hundred and fifty to four hundred thousand dollars per year in addition to what we're currently spending. In other words, this is these will be new expenses. Yeah. And obviously I I know the answer to this leading <laughs> question, but these are not funded mandates. These are un, these are the classic no, unfunded mandates. Surprisingly, so, they are not sending yes, us a check. Yes, we often get mandates from the state and federal government, but we don't actually get the dollars to be no. able to carry them out. Um, and currently, we've, we've tried to fund these things out of the general fund. Right. Um, unlike things like um, our, our water system, where we've set up a self-sustaining enterprise system and exactly. we, we charge... Uh, customers of that system for uh, their water and then we use that money to take care of the water system and the sewer system and the solid waste system. Right. Uh, storm water and flood control we've tried to do just in the general fund exactly. with all the other uh, street repairs and uh, plowing and all the other um, issues. And, and so, so any money we spend on flood control or storm water competes also with schools, police, fire. Exactly. Uh, exactly. The lights in, here in City Hall. Exactly. Uh, so they're, it's difficult to pull out the kind of money for these infrastructures mm -hmm. that they need. Mm -hmm. so, so essentially what's now been proposed, what's pending in the City Council, is the creation of a flood control and stormwater utility, a, sort of an enterprise exactly. fund, if you will, that would be analogous to our water and sewer and our, and our solid waste where uh, users of that system would right. contribute a, an amount based on how much they use or contribute to the system. Exactly. Um, and so, so explain to me about the if you could give folks an idea of how that proposal works and and how it's uh, how it's structured. So this this or this proposal goes back to the task force that you appointed early in 2013. City council appointed. City council, yes. 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 So uh, these people worked on it for four or five months and they came up with a recommendation that we really need new money. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a question of closing a school or shuffling the general fund. We need a new source of money. Mm -hmm. And they identify the fee as the best way to do that. The fee has some interesting advantages. Uh, Smith College, not to pick on them, but mm -hmm. the nonprofit sector, they pay their water bill. Exactly. It's a fee. If they take, uh, back when our landfill was open, if they took trash to the landfill, mm -hmm. they paid the fee. Mm -hmm. They pay a, a sewer fee. Mm -hmm. So fees are not like general uh, property taxes. They're, nobody is exempt from a fee. Mm -hmm. So that looked at appealing for a number of reasons, including the fact that the nonprofit sector would participate. Exactly, including the city of Northampton. Exactly. Yeah. The municipality will uh, contribute as well. So the trick, or the, the challenge, mm -hmm. is how do you create a fee for stormwater? Mm -hmm. It's a little bit different than, for example, a water meter 
Yeah. You can't exactly measure. Mm -hmm. The best proxy we have for the stormwater impact of a given property is, is the size of the property. Mm -hmm. Presumably a large property has a more stormwater runoff than a small property. Mm -hmm. If we simply left it at that and said, okay, we will set a budget for the year. Mm -hmm. We'll divide the budget by the number of square feet in the city, and that will be our rate per square foot. Mm -hmm. Well, as soon as you run the numbers on that, you realize that farmland, for example, Grow Food Northampton, which the whole city contributed to, towards, mm -hmm. and we worked real hard to create that, that open space there, they would get a bill of well over $5,000 a year for stormwater, mm -hmm. which is probably impractical, and it certainly wasn't our intention. Mm -hmm. King Street, on the other hand, which is largely paved, would get off almost scot-free. Mm -hmm. The burden would be borne mostly by farmers, forest land. Mm -hmm. So simply saying by the square foot didn't work. Mm -hmm. So we had to modify that and adjust it. And the uh, proposal builds on the work of the task force. Mm -hmm. Basically, the proposal is this. Impervious area, that, er that is area where if rain falls, it has to run off, so a roof is impervious. Mm -hmm. A Hope, driveway. A driveway. Mm -hmm. um, so impervious area, we're going to use a multiplier to adjust that slightly. We're going to multiply the amount of impervious area on a parcel of property mm -hmm. by 0.95. Okay. So we're not going to say 100% of that surface is impervious. Maybe there's some cracks in the pavement mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. So, But 95% of, of that portion of the property is impervious, mm -hmm. and we're going to count that toward the fee. Mm -hmm. The other piece of the property is pervious ground. Mm -hmm. Pervious would be forest, lawn, um, an empty lot, mm -hmm. anything where the water can soak into the soil. Mm -hmm. Agricultural land is pervious, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, and we're going to multiply the amount of, well, first of all, we're going to limit the amount of pervious property that we're going to send a bill for to one acre. So it'll be a cap. It's a yeah. cap, yes. Yeah. So if you have a 10 acre woodlot, mm -hmm. we're only going to bill you for one acre of mm -hmm. that 10. Mm -hmm. If you have a 50 acre woodlot, one acre. Mm -hmm. So that's the first step mm -hmm. is in order, we, we, you know, basically we want to encourage open land, exactly. pervious land. This, exactly. That's good from yeah. a stormwater perspective. Yeah. Exactly. So we'll cap pervious billing at one acre. Mm -hmm. And in addition, we're going to use a multiplier for pervious of 0.1. So you may have 40,000 square feet of pervious property on your lot, mm -hmm. but we're only going to bill you for a tenth of that, mm -hmm. or 4,000. Mm -hmm. After that, it's just simple math. Um, so the, the, a lot of residents obviously are wondering, well, how does this affect my home? How does this that's affect a great my, question. my single family home? Um, how will, will single-family single homes be treated? We heard a lot from residents in the uh, various meetings. Uh, particularly people who own small houses. Mm -hmm. They did not want to be lumped in with larger properties. Mm -hmm. So we realized we needed to come up with some way to have tiers, if you will, mm -hmm. for billing residential properties. Mm -hmm. There are 6,000, approximately 6,600 residential properties in the city. Mm -hmm. And we're looking for ways to come up with a standard bill for most of those residences. Okay. So basically, and here I'll, I'll refer you to this slide, Basically, we have the ability with aerial mapping mm -hmm. to look down on a property and to isolate which portions of the property are impervious. Mm -hmm. And we can, with computers, it's, it's remarkable, we can even come up with fairly quickly with a number of how many square feet of impervious surface is on each residential mm -hmm. property. Mm -hmm. So the plan is, and the proposal that's in front of the city council is, mm -hmm. If you have less than 2,000 square feet of impervious property, mm -hmm. your bill will be about $60, $65 a year. Mm -hmm. If you're between 2,000 and 4,000, your bill would be about $93 a year. Okay. And if you have more than 4,000 square feet of impervious property on your lot, mm -hmm. your bill would be up around $230 per year. Mm -hmm. And so the and so that's for the residentials, and right. then for the commercial properties, you're going to just do a straight calculation, property by property by yes. property. There are about 2,600 um, non-residential properties, okay. and we'll calculate each one of those properties individually. But for the average, you know, you know, 
moderate to small size single family parcel, which we have many of them, yeah. um, you're saying that fee annually would be 60? 60, 60 or $90. Okay. 60 for many properties in the yeah. inner city. Okay. It might be 90 for some of the larger properties. In and the that would presumably probably be billed on a quarterly basis. Yeah. So basically $15 a quarter. Right. Um, and again, the, I, the goal is to collect all these fees um, and to create a funding source that can then be used to do all this infrastructure work right. that we're now being required by uh, the federal government um, to work on our flood control, to right. work on our on our infrastructure. Yeah. Um, so, in the remaining you know three or four minutes that we have, um, uh, right now you've been holding a series of public meetings around mm -hmm. the city. Uh, city councilors have been hosting those, and you've put together. I know there's a lot of great material on the city website uh, set up for stormwater and flood control. There's video. There's an excellent video. Yeah. I know that uh, former Councilor Dostal put together, yeah. Yeah. which really graphically shows you in about seven minutes how this flood control system that you described yeah. uh, uh, wa was talked about. And, and I know the DPW also did a mailing uh, to households. Every resident in the city. Uh huh. To, to just explaining the exactly, details. just so that they're aware of this, and then you know the city council just had its last meeting, and in, and uh, you know in January there'll be a new city council seated, mm -hmm. um, and then presumably they will be uh, taking up this matter um, in the months ahead. Th that's our hope. Okay. <clears throat> um, we would like to get some resolution on this. The re requirements from the EPA will not wait. Mm -hmm. When they issue the new permit, um, there is no room for discussion with mm -hmm. the EPA. Mm -hmm. If we run afoul of the Clean Water Act, mm -hmm. the fines will start right away. Mm -hmm. the, there's not much room and for discussion. And the fines could be on the order of... Uh, they're draconian. Yeah. They're, uh, they could be tens of thousands of dollars each day. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I know that this is not, uh, th this, uh, this concept of a stormwater flood control utility is not unique, certainly to Northampton. I know that in other parts of the country, uh, uh, Chicopee has one, Westfield, Westfield has one. Yeah. And I was even, a friend of, a uh, colleague was just in Tennessee and mentioned that, uh, that it's fairly common. There's actually a state law in Tennessee that allows for the creation of these, uh, yeah. funds, obviously. Places near big rivers, yeah, uh, well, that's, this that's, is an issue. That's exactly right. Up uh, and down the Mississippi, up and the down the Tennessee River. Exactly, and, uh, exactly. Um, so, you know, for, for people that want to learn more about this, obviously there's a lot of great information on the website. Um, mm -hmm. There's videos of the many public hearings that have been held on it, public yeah, forums that have sure. been held on it. They can certainly contact their city councilor, contact the, the Department of Public Works. Um, and there's going to be some additional meetings uh, Coming up, I think. I think there's going to be at least one large meeting at JFK, maybe two. Okay, as great. the city council works through this process. Yeah, we've pretty much wrapped up all of the meetings ward by ward. Okay, so after the new year, there'll be an opportunity for people to continue to weigh in on it, and yeah. then obviously, then the city council uh, will have to take the vote on it. And as mayor, I'll need to approve that. But right. uh, I want to thank you for. A, for being on the show today, but more importantly, for your service to the city. The Board of Public Works is a citizen board um, that's uh, tasked with uh, working with and, and helping guide policy decisions for the Department of Public Works. And, uh, and this particular project is a massive it's, undertaking. It's been two, two years of... Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and I really appreciate the time you've spent uh, going out around the community to really help people understand this. And, uh, and I hope people will take the time to, uh, to really look at this information, to understand uh, the situation so that we can make an informed decision as a community next year. So thank you for being on the Mayor's Report. You're very welcome, uh, Mayor. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in again to the Mayor's Report. Um, as always, if you have uh, questions or, or ideas for future episodes, call my office, 587-1249. Uh, email me at mayor at northamptonma.gov. Um, and I look forward to seeing you uh, in a future episode. Uh, best wishes for the holidays and a safe and happy new year to you all. Thank you.